Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the University of St. Thomas School of Law in the Frey Moot Court room. I am Hank Shea. I'm a fellow here at the School of Law and its Holleran Center for Ethical Leadership. And in this Jubilee year of mercy and our season of Lent, we are privileged today to be joined by Jean Bishop, who will speak to us on change of heart, justice, mercy, and making peace with my sister's killer, which also happens to be the title of her recently published book on the power of mercy and reconciliation and restorative justice. Jean Bishop is the sister of Nancy Bishop Langert, who was murdered along with her husband and their unborn child in 1990. Nancy was 25 years old and pregnant when she was shot to death by a 16-year-old intruder. He later was convicted and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Since the murder of her family members, Jean Bishop has been an advocate for gun violence prevention, abolition of the death penalty, forgiveness, and the rights of crime victims. She's a graduate of Northwestern University School of Law, where she is an adjunct professor teaching trial advocacy. She's the recipient of Northwestern Law's Alumni Award for Distinguished Public Service. Jean Bishop left a career in corporate law following the murder of her family members to join the office of the Cook County Public Defender in Chicago, Illinois, where she is a felony trial assistant. Following Jean's remarks, she'll be joined by our own University of St. Thomas School of Law professor Mark Osler, and they'll take your questions. Um, Jean and Mark have long collaborated with each other, uh, particularly in seeking abolition of capital punishment. Um, this includes uh, one particular project that they started, uh, Mark originated, and they started uh, involving the trial of Jesus Christ, a mock sentencing capital trial of Jesus that brings together a juxtaposition of faith and the practice of the death penalty. The very first trial that they ever did together, with Mark as the prosecutor and Jean as the defense lawyer of Jesus of Nazareth, took place in this courtroom almost five years ago. And since then, they have performed this trial throughout the country on more than 15 different occasions. There's much more to say, but we want you to hear it from Jean Bishop and then from Mark Osler. So please join Jean Bishop. Join me in greeting Jean Bishop. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be here and to be back in this room because this is where I um, very first did the trial of Jesus with Professor Osler. And Hank Shea was our, our judge, our mock judge. And it, it's just such an honor to be back here. So thank you. Um, this is a story that starts in Lent, uh, the night before Palm Sunday, um, April 7th, 1990. And it was a very happy occasion because my younger sister, Nancy, who was 25 years old, had just revealed to my family that she and her husband, Richard, who was age 29, were going to have a baby, their very first child. And this was a very big deal because this would have been the first grandchild from my mom and dad. It would have been my first little niece or nephew. So we were all over the moon with happiness. And we went out to celebrate this um, happy news at a restaurant on Chicago's Clark Street, Italian restaurant. And we had pasta and wine. And I brought a baby gift for Nancy that, from a trip I had just taken. And we all hugged goodnight in the parking lot afterwards. And I hugged Nancy and I said, I'll see you tomorrow, because I was planning to see her at the end of the day after church. And that's something I never say anymore. I'll see you tomorrow because it seems to me now like a, a kind of a foreboding of, of doom. So my parents went home to their house in the suburbs and I went back to my apartment on Chestnut Street. And Nancy and Richard went back to their townhouse in one of the safest, most affluent communities in the country, Winnetka, Illinois. And when they walked through the door, the killer was waiting for them. He had taken a glass cutter and cut the glass of a sliding glass door in the back of the townhouse because he was smart enough to know that if he'd broken the glass, it would have made a noise and the neighbors would have called the police. And so at the crime scene, you can see these pieces of glass silently stacked on the ground. 
And then he entered and he took a chair, like a chair like one of these, and just pulled it into the middle of the floor, of the living room floor, because from that vantage point you could see every possible entrance and exit. The back door he had come through, the side door off the kitchen, and the front door. He had a 357 Magnum revolver loaded with 38 caliber bullets. It was a gun he'd stolen a few early, days earlier. And he sat there and waited for them to come home. And when they walked through the front door, he pointed that gun at them. And he handcuffed my brother-in-law, Richard, who was a six foot three, 230 pound former high school athlete. Um, and so incapacitated him by handcuffing him. And that's when Nancy and Richard started begging for their lives, basically negotiating with him. They offered him their belongings that they had there. Nancy had cashed her paycheck that day and all $500 of it was found strewn on the ground of the crime scene, almost as if she had handed it to him, like, here, take this, and he had tossed it aside. Then at some point, their dog, Nancy Richard had a little dog, a Cocker Spaniel named Pepsi, and it ran down into the living room, and I don't think he realized that there was a dog in the house, and it startled him, and he accidentally squeezed the trigger of the gun, and a bullet went into the living room wall, and at the crime scene you could see this bullet hole in the wall. And that's when they said, right, someone is going to hear this and call the police, and, and you should lock us in and go. So he took them at gunpoint down into the basement where they thought they were going to be locked in, but instead he put the gun to the back of Richard's head, and he fired once execution style. And I always think of what that must have done to her to look and see this man she loved that she wanted to have children with and raise a family with and grow old with just fall to the floor dead and then to see the gun turned on her and so when he pointed the gun at her she instinctively covered up her own head with her hands and so he fired instead twice into her pregnant side and abdomen and fled and left her there to bleed to death the autopsy by the coroner estimated that she lived about 10 or 15 minutes after that happened. And the blood in the basement and the marks on her body shows what she did next. First thing she tried to do is call for help because those are the days before cell phones. She had no phone, there was no phone in the basement. And so at the crime scene you could see a metal shelf and a tool and indentations on the shelf. She had taken a tool and banged on this shelf trying to make a noise that someone, anyone would hear and investigate and maybe find them and save them. And at some point I think she realized that she was dying, that no help was going to come. And so you could see these marks on, scrapes on her elbows. She dragged herself by her elbows over to where Richard was lying. And before she died next to him, she wrote this message in her own blood. It's a heart shape in the letter U. I love you. Which is how she used to um, sign her cards and letters to him. And then she died there next to him. And the next day, my father went over to their house after church. It was Palm Sunday. And he rang the doorbell and no one answered. And then he had a kind of foreboding of doom. He had a key to the townhouse and he opened the door. And the first thing he saw was the broken glass in the back and the dog running around the living room floor and the light on in the basement. And he went to the top of the basement stairs and looked down and there was Nancy and Richard there lying there frozen in death. And at that very moment, I was standing in the back of my church in Chicago, my big downtown church where I sang in the choir and still do. And it's Palm Sunday and I've got my choir robe on and I've got my music folder and my palm branch and I'm ready to walk down the aisle. And the church secretary comes to me and puts her hand on my arm and says, there's a phone call for you. And I was startled, like why would somebody be calling me at church? And I said, well, can you take a message? And she said, no, you need to come with me. And I went to her office and picked up the phone, and it was my father on the other line. And he said these words to me, Nancy and Richard have been killed. And I said, what do you mean they've been killed? And he said, somebody killed them. 
And that was the moment that evil intruded on my life in a way that it never had before. The idea that someone could deliberately take the precious life of my beautiful sister, who loved life, who was the sweetest, most charming, um, funny, she was the comedian, the life of the party. She was the one that loved to cook and do crafts and have people over and go to baseball games and was carrying life in her body. I could not imagine someone snuffing out that life. And so my parents minister, the pastor from their church, came and picked me up and drove me to the Winnetka police station. And at that point, we didn't even know how they had been killed. And we found out that they had been shot to death, that Nancy and Richard had been shot. And the first words that came out of my mouth, I don't even know where this came from, were this, I don't want to hate anyone. I didn't even know who had done it. We wouldn't know for six whole months the investigation stayed open before we find out who had done it. But I knew already that if I hated whoever had done it, that I would drift just unmoored into this endless ocean of, of bitterness and vengeance and hatred, and I knew I didn't want to do that. And so for six months, we didn't know who had done it. And I was a corporate lawyer, as Hank mentioned, at, on LaSalle Street in Chicago. And I'd walk down these you know, streets full of thousands of people and see people pass by. And I'd think, is it him? Did he do it? Is it her? Is it them? I mean, are, are, do they hate my family? Are they coming back to finish them off? And just when I kind of despaired and thought the trail to whoever had done it was growing cold, I got a phone call one night in my apartment on Chestnut Street. It was Jay Levine from Channel 2 News wanting to get my reaction to the arrest in my sister's murder case. And I said, what arrest? And he said, there's a teenager in custody in the Winnetka police station. And I said, I've got to go. <laughs> and I hung up the phone and I rushed out to my parents' house to find out more. It was. It was a 16-year-old boy, a high school junior at the big public high school in Winnetka, Illinois, New Trier High School, one of the best high schools in the country. A friend of his, also a 16-year-old boy, a junior at New Trier, a friend of his that he'd bragged to about killing them, turned him in to the police. And the police went to his suburban home, his million dollar home on Willow Road in Winnetka with a search warrant and found the 357 Magnum revolver, speed loaders and bullets, handcuffs like the ones he used to handcuff Richard, this trophy notebook of press clippings that he had torn out of the newspaper about the murders, his own poem he'd written there called I Am Cain. You know that story of Cain and Abel in the Bible where Cain kills his brother Abel? And it's about how he is like Cain the murderer and about the strength and power of evil and the weakness of good. We even found out that Nancy, that um, he had gone to Nancy and Richard's funeral. And so the police arrested him. They took him into custody at the big Cook County Jail at uh, 26th and California in Chicago. And a year later, he stood trial. And he took the stand, this skinny 16-year-old boy, and blamed it on a friend. Blamed it on this innocent friend of his, said that the friend had brought the gun to his home that night and said, here, I just killed two people with this gun and hide it for me to explain why he had this gun in his room. The jury didn't buy it. Nobody believed it. It contradicted the mountain of evidence against him, including his own confession. And so after deliberating for two hours, the jurors convicted him of the double homicide of Nancy and Richard and the intentional killing of the unborn child. Because one of the things that emerged was that he knew Nancy was pregnant. Richard, her husband, had begged him not to hurt her. So don't hurt my wife she's expecting, please. And so a month later, he was sentenced. And he was given the mandatory sentence at that time in the state of Illinois when you kill them more than one person in the same incident as a juvenile. And that's life in prison without the possibility of parole. So what does that mean? That means that you go to prison and you die there. You come out in a coffin. There's never a second look at you ever. There's never a parole hearing where we'll see, are you rehabilitated? Can we let you out safely? You go into prison as a teenager and you come out when you are dead. And he got that sentence not only for killing Nancy and Richard. There was a possibility of that same sentence for killing the unborn child. The judge could have given him a term of years, 
but he could also have enhanced the sentence up to a life sentence for killing the baby if there was some aggravating factor, something about it that was exceptionally heinous. And the judge found that shooting a pregnant woman in the belly is a heinous thing to do and a heinous way to kill that child that you know she is carrying. And so the judge sentenced him to life without parole for that too. And as they were leading him away after sentencing through the door between the lockup and the courtroom, taking him back into the lockup, my mother was sitting next to me on this hard wooden bench where the spectators sit. And she turned to me and she said, we'll never see him again. And I was glad of that. I thought, good. And I was glad of the sentence that he received. I had forgiven him, not directly to him, because he had never apologized to me or my family, never taken responsibility, never showed any remorse whatsoever. I forgave him in my own mind and heart, my own letting go of him to God. But it wasn't for him or about him in any way. It was really for God and for Nancy and for me. It was for God because we know that our Christian faith commands us to forgive. It's right there in the words of our Lord's Prayer. You know, for, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. When Peter comes to Jesus and says, how often do I have to forgive this brother of mine? Seven times? And Jesus says, 70 times seven. In other words, infinity, endlessly, that you have to keep forgiving. And so I knew that, that out of obedience to my Christian faith, I had to forgive. But it, it was beyond that, though. It was also for Nancy. She, as I told you, was the most life-loving, just amazingly good person, and I could not imagine having her memorial be hatred and vengeance and bitterness. That she wouldn't want that for herself. And that I knew that somehow to honor her life that ended at age 25, I'd already gotten to live a few years longer than she had at that point. And I knew that the rest of my life had to be about somehow making her memorial be this living, breathing thing that prevents violence, that stops gun violence, that stops the death penalty, that stops this digging of more graves and creating more grieving families. And then finally I forgave for me because I knew that hating him wouldn't affect him at all, but it could consume me, it could eat me alive. There's this saying that I love to quote and that I heard that, Hating another person is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. And I didn't want to do that. And so I forgave him, but the image that I have when I think of what my forgiveness was like of him was like this, I forgive you. And now I am wiping you off my hands like dirt. And I am shaking you off my feet like dust and I'm leaving you behind. I'm never gonna think about you again, ever. And I went forward, and for 20 years, that's what I did. I thought about Nancy and Richard and their baby and how to honor God. I left the corporate job. I became a public defender. It's a job I have and still love every day. And I went to death penalty conferences to speak, and that's where I met this man, Mark Osler, law professor, who I thought was the most fascinating opponent of the death penalty because here's this former prosecutor, somebody whose job it was to prosecute crimes and lock people up, that from his Christian faith, he opposed the death penalty. And so I met him at this conference, and he heard my story about being a, a victim's family member who was against the death penalty. And he was kind enough to give me not only his wonderful book, Jesus on Death Row, but also another book by a former colleague of his when he taught law at Baylor in Waco, Texas, the heart of the death penalty country. And this is by a man named Randall O'Brien, a Yale divinity educated pastor, author, academic. He was the head of the religion department at Baylor, then its provost, and now president of Carson Newman University in Tennessee. And the chapter that Randall wrote in this book that Professor Osler gave me is on forgiveness. And he knew that I was interested in this. And so I'm reading this chapter on forgiveness and thinking, wow, this is really great. And then I get to this one sentence, and I came skidding to a halt. And here's the sentence. The sentence is this. No Christian man or woman is relieved of the obligation to work to reconcile with those who've wronged them. No Christian man or woman is relieved of the obligation to work to reconcile with those who've wronged them. And when I read this, I was absolutely infuriated. I just thought, 
I have forgiven this young man. I have not thirsted for vengeance against him. I'm doing all this good in the memory of my sister because I'm not thinking about him. He's never apologized to me or my family. No remorse, no responsibility. And you're telling me it's my job to go over to where he is and hold out my hand and say, let's reconcile with one another. And I was so mad at him for giving me this book, I called to yell at him. <laughs> and this terrible book with this terrible sentence in it that he had given me. And he said, don't yell at me, you know, go talk to Randall O'Brien. He wrote it. And I said, I can't call a college president and complain about this thing that he wrote, you know. And he said, no, you can. He said, Randall will be very gracious and he'll be very loving and he'll maybe demur a little bit and then he'll tell you the truth. And so I said, okay, all right, I want to call him. And so I got at the nerve to call the president of this university to complain about his book, and he wasn't there, and I left a message with the secretary, and I thought, oh, you know, it's never going to call back. But a few days later, I was sitting in the parking lot at O'Hare Airport. I write about this moment in my book. It's one of those dark, freezing, cold nights where the snow's swirling around and the earth is like iron. And I'm waiting for someone to fly in at the airport, and they're late. And I'm sitting in the parking lot, and my cell phone rings. And it's this voice, this voice that sounds like Jimmy Carter, because it's, it's Randall, and he's from the South, from Mississippi. He's like, Jane Bishop? And, I said, and it was him. And I told him the story I told all of you about this horrible murder in my family, about this remorseless killer, about this life sentence where I don't have to think about him anymore. And I said, and you're telling me that I have to reconcile with him. And so he did exactly what Mark Osler said he would do. He said, oh, he was very loving and very complimentary. And oh, you sound like such a wonderful person and so spiritually advanced. And I'm sure in time you will discern. You know, and I said, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. What would this even look like? And he said it would look like Jesus on the cross. And I started to cry because I knew what he meant before he even finished that sentence. He said, I, I knew, Father, forgive them, right? Father, forgive them. Jesus is on the cross. He's surrounded by people who are not sorry. They have not shown remorse. They have not apologized. They're in the process of taking his life, and he does something that I had never once done for this young man who killed my sister. He was praying for them. He's praying to his Heavenly Father for them. And Randall said, wouldn't it be amazing if Jesus brought this young man home to God through you? And I shook my head and thought, that's impossible, this remorseless killer coming back to the embrace of God. And yet I knew at the same time that if you call yourself a Christian, you believe that God can do the impossible. That's your faith. And so the first thing I needed to do was repent. And what I needed to repent of is what I had been doing for 20 years, which is refusing to say the name of this young man who killed my sister. I did what I've done this today so far, which is just call him the killer, the intruder, the teenager, the offender, and never by his name. And so it was at a church where I was speaking with Mark Osler that for the first time I said his name, David Biro. His name is David Biro, And what Randall got me to see is that he is a child of God, just like I am. God loves him every bit as much as God loves me. And I am as flawed and fallen as he is. We are all guilty of the death of the sinless Son of God. And I had built this wonderfully convenient wall for me between me and David Biro, where over here is you, evil murderer, and over here was me, good innocent victim's family member. And I don't have to deal with you at all. And what Randall got me to see is that God obliterates that wall. We are on this flat plane of grace before the God who loves us and made all of us. And so I started to pray for him. And I did that in the only place I could, in the place where my sister and her husband and their baby are buried. It's right outside the church where they were married in Kenilworth, Illinois, right by the lakefront, this beautiful stone wall covered with ivy, and I just dropped to my knees and I asked God, like, open my heart. Just open my heart and do something with this. So then I had a conversation again with Mark Osler. 
And this is around the time, 2012, when there had been a case handed down by the United States Supreme Court called Miller versus Alabama. And that case said that the sentence that David Bureau was serving was unconstitutional. That mandatory sentence for a juvenile without considering a factor like their age, their upbringing, and so on, was a violation of the Eighth Amendment ban on cruel and unusual punishment. And so now he might be resentenced. And so I said, uh, talking it over with him, he's a legal expert on constitutional law and criminal law, and I said, you know, I don't know how I feel about it being, re I mean, I'm praying for him and all of this, but, you know, I, I really don't know how I feel about this. I mean, he's still remorseless. And Mark said, you don't know that. How do you know that? You've never even spoken to him. And I thought, oh my God, I had gone, through 20 years of talking about forgiveness and forgiveness, forgiveness, and I had forgiven him, and I told the whole world but him, everybody but him. And so I wrote a letter. I reprinted it in its entirety in my book. I, I wrote to him, to David Bureau, and I said, I forgave you a long time ago, and I told everyone in the world but you, and that was wrong. I am sorry. And I've been waiting all these years for you to apologize to me. I'll go first. I am sorry, and if you want me to come visit you, I will. And I mailed that letter the way you do when you send off any important thing, like an application to your dream school or something, or you just say a prayer like, God, do something with this. And I didn't hear, and I didn't hear, and I thought, oh, he probably tore it up and threw it away. He probably showed it to his cellmate and laughed over it. He probably ran it by his lawyer, and the lawyer said, don't say anything. And I figured I wouldn't hear at all. And then one day I walked into my office, the public defender office, and there's this big envelope, and it's from a prisoner, and I thought, well, I get a lot of mail from prisoners, so I didn't think anything of it until I saw that name in the corner bureau up in the return address. And I brought it to my desk, and I sat down, and my heart was pounding, like, what would this be? And for two days, I couldn't open it. I was just so terrified of what I'd read there that it would just crush my heart. And so I turned again to Mark Gosler. I asked him to read it first, to open it, and tell me, was it good or not, and could I bear it? And he did that. And the first thing he said to me after reading it was, it's good. And then he read it to me in his own voice, very thoughtfully, later on, so that I would hear the words of this killer from someone that I knew and trusted. And the very first thing that David Bureau writes in this letter is, I know you've been waiting, you and your family, all this time for, to hear this. I won't make you wait any longer. I am guilty. I did kill your sister and her husband, and I'm so sorry. If I could take it back, I would. And then he traces his trajectory, his change over 20 years from going to being, from being remorseless to watching TV in prison and seeing some heinous crime and thinking, oh, that person's an animal. I can't believe what they did. And then thinking, wait a second, that's me. I did that. I did something that horrible. And then he had a loss. and wanted to just know why, why did this happen? And then he thought, wait a second, the Bishop family, like they want to know, why did I cause this grievous loss in their family? And so he started reading and thinking and reflecting. And, and so he said, yes, come and see me. So I did. I write about this in the book. I visited him. I'm visiting him still. It's incredibly healing for me to be able to hear answers to these questions that I had. I mean, one of the things I learned I never would have known without David Bureau is what a hero my brother-in-law was right up into the end from the moment that gun was pointed at Nancy until the moment the gun was put to Richard's head, he never stopped trying to suggest and beg and plead for ways that he would let her go, that he would let her live. And it's incredibly healing for me to have that victim impact statement I never got to have. When you have a mandatory sentence, there's no aggravation and mitigation proceedings in court where the victims get to do their victim impact statement. So I get to tell him what this did to my mother, my father, to everyone who loved Nancy and Richard, their friends, their neighbors, their coworkers. And David said to me the other day, the more I get to know your sister through you, the worse I feel about what I did. In other words, she's starting to take shape as a human being, not just this shadowy figure in the dark, this person he didn't know, this stranger, but this girl who loved to make dinners for her family or go to the beach on a picnic.
that's justice. That's the best justice I could receive is seeing this process where he is being redeemed. And so why does this matter? It matters on two levels, I think. One, it matters to all of us because there's no one in this room who is unscathed. Everyone here has something that they have to forgive, some wound, some deep betrayal, some loss, some deliberate attack. And I think all of us also have something of which we need to be forgiven, some ways that we have hurt and failed others. It matters because of the larger question of what we do with people. Do we throw them away when they do wrong or do we bring them back? We live in a country that has 5% of the world's population and 25% of its prison population. We are the only nation on earth that sentences its juveniles to this merciless life without parole sentence. And we incarcerate more people than any nation on earth. And it is because of this putting away. One of the joys of doing this now in this year of Jubilee is the words of Pope Francis. And Susan Stabile from this law school was kind enough to share them with me. And I was so astonished when I read it. Listen to what Pope Francis says. When faced with the gravity of sin, God responds with the fullness of mercy. Mercy will always be greater than any sin, and no one can place limits on the love of God who is ever ready to forgive. No one can place limits on God who is ever ready to forgive. So I want to open this up now to your thoughts and your questions about this. But this is the question. Is, do we believe that anyone is beyond the mercy of God, or the forgiveness of God? Do we believe that anyone is incapable of redemption? I think that this one story is my witness to the fact that in redemption, in reconciliation, there is such profound healing, not just for him, but for me, and I think for all of us. So. So before you do that, in the dead zone there, um, <clears throat> one of the things I want to recognize, too, about, about Gene's story and what's different about it is that in my field of criminal law, there's prosecutors and there's defense attorneys. And there's a tendency for each side to see themselves as the virtuous ones, the ones who are on the right side, defending the citizen accused, or from the prosecutor's perspective, making sure that the streets are safe. Um, you know, as a prosecutor, it was hard not to think that way constantly. I mean, you'd read police reports that would identify the target as bad guy one, bad guy two. Um, and of course, justice takes both of those sides. So where is morality in that? Part of it comes down to this. Criminal law is all tragedy. It's all tragedy. And this was something that surprised me as a prosecutor, um, that the first time that I won a case and the jury came back and said guilty, I expected it would feel like, you know, rocky at the top of the steps, but it didn't because it's still all tragedy. You never get to unmurder someone. You never unrape a woman. The best you can do is hope that your actions, and this is important, is going to prevent, will prevent a tragedy into the future. But when your job, whether it's on the defense side or the prosecution side, is all wrapped up in tragedy that way, um, part of morality is remaining engaged with the human dignity of the people involved. Prosecutors lose their morality when they stop seeing the defendants as people. The victims, to see the victims and the victims' family members as humans. And it's draining, it's emotionally challenging to do that over and over and over. And for defense attorneys, too, that challenge of remaining emotionally engaged, of seeing the full scope of the humanity, the story of their clients, sometimes which seems like it's the same story over and over and over again, that is tiring and emotionally draining. And part of the victory of morality that Gene has described, what's remarkable about it, 
is that ability to remain engaged with the story, even of the person who killed her best friend and sister. Um, and I just want to recognize what that is before we go on and, and, and take questions. So. so your thoughts and questions? Yes? Yeah, that's how my that's how my book opens. Actually, um, you know, driving into that parking lot and you know, kind of walking and not knowing what it would be like because his father and I had met the day before. I got in touch with the prisoner's father to let him know that I was going to see him, and he walked me through the whole drill. Um, and that when you are first introduced, you know, you have an opportunity to have contact with one another before you're taken to opposite sides of this, you know, cubicle with the glass in between. And I thought, I'm going to shake the hand that held that gun. Because I knew that that's what I would do when you meet someone for the first time, you shake hands. So I go to the place where you sign in, you know, with the prison guard, and you sign in, you know, your license plate number and your name and address and, you know, gender and all these things. And the last box that you fill in is visitor's relationship to offender. And and, and that's where I'm like, well, until now I would have said victim's family member, evil murderer, right? And now, so I'm looking at the other, well, what did the other people, visitors, right? And so it was like either friend or family. It was like girlfriend, uncle, whatever. And I, I wasn't his friend. We'd never met. And I wasn't his family. So I wrote visitor. And the guard didn't like that. So he so are you a family member? I said, no, he goes, friend. So he writes in friend, right? In that first meeting, I didn't have an agenda. I just prayed the whole way. The whole way, I was just there like, God, just speak. You speak. Speak the words you want to say. And what I found going in to see him was really that the first thing that he wanted to do, that he needed to do, was just to tell me the story of that night, April 7th, 1990. He just wanted to tell me from beginning to end. And in a very sensitive way, every once in a while, he paused and said, are you sure you want to hear this? Because this is really hard. And I said, no, I do. I want to hear all of it, even the hard part. Like about how he found out the next day. When he left, he didn't know Nancy was dead. She, he thought she might have survived and lived to identify him. And so when he heard on the news the next day that she was dead, he was glad. He was relieved. So even the hard stuff like that, um, it, was, it was good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. My father sadly passed away before this whole thing happened. He passed away um, 12 years ago, just after my little one was born. Um, and my mother's 86 years old. And so she, uh, she just wants nothing to do with him. She doesn't want to hear about him. And I would never dis, you know, dishonor my mom by trying to convince her otherwise. I totally respect her way that she wants to live her life and remember Nancy. But this wonderful thing happened, though, with respect to my dad. So before he died, he had taught the confirmation class at his church to the 7th and 8th graders. And my mom had asked me, like, last year, I think, to help clean out this old file cabinet of his papers down in the basement. She was finally going to empty this thing out and just wanted me to make sure that she wasn't throwing out anything important. So it's little bank records and tax returns and stuff. And then I come across this little notepad with his handwriting on it, with the word forgiveness at the top. It was his notes from a lecture he gave to his confirmation class about forgiveness. And so I'm fascinated, right? And he said in his notes, there was a tragedy in my family, and I've had to confront this idea of forgiveness. And forgiveness has two parts. The first part is the letting go, right? Just the letting go of your righteous anger and your right to have vengeance because of this terrible thing that happened to you. But my father went on, he said, the second part is harder, and that's the letting in. The letting in of this person who did this to you, back into relationship with you. That's the steeper, harder way. That's the way of the cross, right? And I think, oh my gosh, if he were alive today, I have to believe he'd be making that drive to Pontiac Prison with me, that he would, he would, he would hear this young man out. 
Yes. strikes me that your ability to talk beautifully and moving about forgiveness and mercy comes through that experience. And that we can, you know, we're here at a law school and we do a lot of talking about the law, but it's it's in in and through that experience, that nearness to another, experiencing our common humanity, that we really enter into the truth of, of what is so important in life. And that that struck me in your talk that uh, through that experience of Thank you. You know, one of the things that about reading the Gospels that, you know, is so challenging is you come across things like Jesus' admonition of, you know, love your enemies, pray for those who are persecuted. And it never really made sense to me before, you know, like, how do you even do that? And, and who is my enemy if not David Biro? But to be able to express through just the act of visiting him, the unconditional love of God for him, it's like, now I get it, right? I get it. Yes, sir. If you were to uh, offer advice to an attendee who was considering kind of a reverse Baptist element, you know, somebody who was living or whatever, was thinking about, you know, what, are, what would you suggest to them to consider before they decide to not do it? What, what mindset do they need to have? I am doing that, actually, because because there's been some publicity about the book through like TV and, and so this story has become known to him. I'm getting letters from prisoners all over the country. Sometimes, you know, from Ohio and California and, and I'll get these letters now all the time for people who are yearning, yearning to ask, to have the chance to tell their victims how sorry they were. Because from the beginning, the criminal justice system conspires to have them not do that to keep them apart. Their lawyer is saying, don't say you're sorry, don't talk to the victims, you're not allowed to, don't say anything. And then their post-conviction lawyers are telling them, you know, to keep, you know, preserve your, you know, deniability. Don't, I mean, the people in prison with David Biro, when they found out that he had, in return for nothing, confessed to me in writing, in his own handwriting, that he had killed my family members, they derided him as a fool. He didn't get any pats on the back from the people around him. They derided him as a fool. But the letters I'm getting are, your story's given me hope that I too might be forgiven. And you know, what do you think? One of the things sometimes that happens when you're in prison and nobody's advocating for you and you're forgotten is that you have to kind of advocate for yourself and it becomes very self-centered. Um, and so one of the things that I hear sometimes is, well, I want to get out and I want to have this life someday and everything. And, and I, what I ask them to do, first of all, is to realize that it's not about you anymore. You have to think first about your victim and their family, their survivors, and all the things that they stood for and the ways that you could honor them with your own life because your life isn't your own anymore. Now it's what you, it's kind of like the way my life isn't my own anymore after Nancy and Richard died. I get to still live, they are dead. And so I'm living for God and for them, you know, to, in, in a, trying to honor them as best I can with this gift I've been given. And so I ask prisoners to think about the fact that every morning they wake up and open their eyes and take a breath. That's the day that their victim did not get to do that and that that has implications for how they live their life, whether they're in prison or out, to do every bit of good that that victim could have done in the world, to express that love of God that's been shown to them just by the mercy of their life. Um, so and, and when you do I that, start, I mean, yeah. part of what you're doing is asking the offender to have empathy. Yeah. And sometimes that's something they've never been asked to do before because of the, you know, we're in our lane as defendant or prosecutor, and, 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 and you're asking them to get out of their lane. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. And, and, you know, it's interesting because with, with David Biro and your relationship with David Biro, that's been part of your challenge to him continually, has been, you know, I, I want you to empathize with those of us who had this loss. And he's done that. Yeah. It, and it's, it's been a remarkable thing, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, part of the context of this, too, is that, that you know, Gene has advocated uh, for, and, and this wasn't really clear in her, her talk necessarily, but, but has been an a international advocate against the death penalty. Her, her sister uh, and, and Jean were advocates uh, and part of a, a victim's family member movement that was against the death penalty. They were for the penalty of juvenile life without parole. And so, uh, in fact, when I, I, I testified in front of the House Judiciary Committee in 2009, and I was going to prepare for it, and the people that were on my side, I was telling them, well, who's going to be on the other side? What are we dealing with? And, and they said, well, <clears throat> the really tough people are the Bishop sisters. <laughs> and they, they made it sound like the Hanson brothers from Slapshot. <laughs> Which was pretty much true, I found out, you know, once, once, once we engaged. And so, in fact, I met Jean at that conference. We were at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Martin Luther King's church. And she leaned forward and tapped on my shoulder, and I turned around and was like, oh, no, it's the other <laughs> bishop sister. Um, but, you know, even with the, the, the advocacy status that, that, that Jean has, this part of the story where prisoners write to her and say, what do I need to do? That you write back with such specific advice, I think, is remarkable, which is that it has to start with, with empathy. And that's a pretty, that's, I think, oftentimes something they have never been asked for before. Right, and that's where we so need restorative justice programs, you know, in prison to have people think about it, even if it isn't directly pairing the actual victim with the offender just to have people like me, kind of like the victim impact panels you do in drunken driving cases where it's just any random you know, victim of a drunk driving, just to get you to think about outside of yourself. I mean, I was randomly assigned on the prison visit I did to this man named Brandon Craighead, who was a young guy in an impoverished part of the town and he ended up shooting to death the very couple that was helping him, this kindly couple that, that was helping him, just out of rage and you know, so I was randomly assigned to see him and he said, I'm so interested in, you know, you're a victim's family member and you're visiting prisoners. And, you know, I said, well, tell me about your victims. So he told me about the couple themselves. And I said, well, did they have children? I mean, who are their survivors? He didn't even know. He hadn't even thought about that, what it would be like to be them, to grow up, to be, all of a sudden be orphaned in one horrible incident and to grow up, you know, without your parents. And he, was just shocked. He never ever thought about that before, and he wrote me these long letters afterwards saying what, what he was now imagining and how it was taking him outside of himself and thinking about himself and him, his future and thinking more about these family members and how they had never heard his apology. So there's so the ground is so fertile, but you know what is it? The harvest is plenty. The laborers are few. We need we need to have this work going on. Yeah. Oh, you. Yeah. You. <laughs> and then you. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't know when my name's Steve, so I was like, I'm Steve, and for 10 years I've prayed for Steve, I've tried to forgive Steve, and I don't know, I think if anything, someone prosecuted it, you know, the person, to know him, and to know that um, he took, you know, I, I want that, right? Right. And how do you, how do you get to, to forgive someone that's never said sorry, and it's never... 
No, it's okay. I'm crying too. <laughs> I'm going to let him answer the second part of that. You <laughs> answer him. the first part. I'm going to give him that. Let me do the first one. First of all, I'm so sorry for what happened to you. And you're an amazingly strong and beautiful woman inside and out. And the fact that you gave him a name, you were so far ahead of me. You did that the next day. It took me 20 plus years to utter the name and to make this awful attacker a human being, you did that immediately. God bless you. What strength and courage you showed by doing that. And your willingness to pray for him, forgive him again, way ahead of me. You know, the secretary that used to work in my office, the public defender's office, this woman named Dolores, beautiful, humble woman, came to me and said, 25 years ago, my sister was killed too. Same time, same type of thing. She was 25 years old too, just like your sister. And they never caught who did it. And it's this hole in my heart. And what you're being called on to do is something that's so much harder than me because I had my earthly justice. And that is that you are doing this forgiveness in the absence of any tangible earthly justice. You don't know if he's still alive. You don't know if he's incarcerated for some other thing he did. You don't know if he's walking the streets free. And it's like that parable of the sower, right, that you write about in I write about this in my book where, you know, you're scattering these seeds and you don't know whether it's going to fall on the fertile ground, you know, where it'll grow or whether it'll be choked by weeds or scorched by the sun. And you're doing it anyway out of this incredible obedience. God is going to richly bless that, I promise you. God will richly bless that, what you've done. So the justice... Yeah, you took the hard one. I know I so, always yeah. do that to you. I go, here, Mark, yeah. you answer that one. Yeah. You, you know, we live in a fascinating moment in history, in that there's a reconsideration of criminal law right now that's being done by people on both sides of good conscience and who are, um, you know, even right here in this area, some of the leaders nationally are, are, are yeah, in this room. Um, yes. One of the problems that we're facing is that criminal law as a whole tends to push down that which humanizes victims and defendants. Um, and that removes human dignity from the equation. That your story isn't told. That your name isn't known. That the name of the person who actually assaulted you. That that person isn't caught. Where are the resources for that? Um, you know, if we had shorter sentences uh, for some of the cases, you know, like narcotics, and we had more resources for clearing violent cases, that would allow those stories to be told. But in a more, more general way, um, you know, we're in a system that's about efficiency. And, uh, you know, there's a high plead, uh, high number of cases that, that plead out, 95% or more in most jurisdictions. And that's because there's a narrow focus on the elements of the crime. And that's what I teach my first years, you know, is let's learn the elements, let's talk about the elements, here's the elements, here's how you'd prove them, uh, here's the efficient way to get to that. But the truth is that, that when we do that and when we have to do that, uh, and when we have sentencing guidelines on top of that, the story never comes out. The story of the victim and the story of the defendant. Um, the clinic that, that we have here, um, you know, where we do clemency, what's remarkable about that work is it's telling the story. And often it's a story that hasn't been told before. Um, you know, the, the cases that we work with are narcotics. And one of the things that people might think is, okay, there's no victim side to that with narcotics. What's surprising to me is so often there's, you know, <clears throat> everything's formulaic, but there's this great question on the clemency petition, question seven. And question seven is, uh, you know, why do you deserve clemency? And question five is, what did you do? And in one of those two questions, we always ask the, the client, write this out in your own words. Give us your answer. The, you know, we want that, that the, the real 
language that they would use to describe what they did. And what's fascinating is how many times narcotics defendants talk about victims. They say, I know what I did to my family and the people around me in my community, and I regret that. But they never had a chance to say that before in the system. Um, and, and now they do. And we need to find ways to make this work where we name more people who are offenders and bring them to justice and at the same time allow the whole story to be a part of the process. Because a lot of times that whole story, both on the offender side and the victim side, is as much about poverty as it is about anything else. Mm. So. Yeah. Right, that's a great question because I, and I, I should have said this and I apologize for not saying it, I realized that the audience I'm addressing are people of different faiths or perhaps no faith at all. And so, you know, the question is, how do we see the value of forgiving and redeeming and not throwing away a human being? One of the people I write about in my book is a mutual hero and friend of ours, um, Bernardine Dorn, who went from a life of being a, a a breaker of the law and a fugitive for two years on the run and knows what it's like to be in prison to having spent her career advocating for the rights of children and women and the poor and you know juvenile offenders taught law at Northwestern University and in the Netherlands and now at University of Chicago Law School part-time and um, she uh, is a someone who doesn't have a, a particular faith and she comes at it from the idea of just the preciousness of every human being, just by virtue of our humanity. You know, in the same way that we think of human rights, you know, that we don't torture, that we don't, you know, abuse, that we don't, you know, exploit children. And, and that you can look at the sacredness of a human being in that way. I told this story this way because it is the truth of my story. And I, when I, at first, when I was talking about this in the death penalty, I wouldn't really bring up the faith part, and he was actually the one who kind of challenged me the, to tell the whole truth of it, and the whole truth does involve my Christian faith. Yeah. I know it's not easy, but it makes sense from like an intellectual perspective. Like an intellectual kind of weird. That's probably not going to help a lot of people from an emotional perspective. So is it like a constant struggle with the choice of ability to anger? Or? That's such a great question about, you know, is it a constant struggle to kind of let go of that anger and bitterness? So I start every morning at this little goofy gym in my town, the half mile from my house, because you know, I'm on the treadmill and then you're know, doing some weights and stuff and you're know, watching Morning Joe and everything. And I do that every day, you know, to, say, to stay strong. And that's kind of what forgiveness is like. It's not like this one-time only thing. It's this thing that you keep doing, right? Like this. <laughs> you keep. Yeah, you. You know, I can feel the anger rising up in me. You know, sometimes when a lot of people come to me with like their prisoner. Like I just got. I forwarded this email to you. I think a day or two ago, the letter that I got from a mom you know, for her son, who'd done this horrific rape and murder, you know, tied this woman up, slit her wrist, you know, kind of placed her body in a way that she took her three hours to die after he left her like that, between the bleeding and the asphyxiation. She saw a, a, a little girl who she was babysitting that was asleep in the room next to her, remembers hearing kind of whimpers and cries from this girl who's dying. And, you know, now he, Really, he's been a model prisoner and he wants to get out, you know? He thinks that it should just be this get out of jail card free, you know? And that kind of thing makes me angry. Because, and I, and I feel that rising up and then I think that's not helpful. That's not how I can help this mom, this prisoner that wants to write to me, this little girl who's now a grown woman and is still living with the nightmare of having lived through this. Anger is not strength, anger's weakness. See, people think that the love part, the forgiveness part, is weak and squishy and everything. It's not. That is that is strength. You know, I want to go back a question, yeah. too, about the, the the issue of faith being at the center. Oh, yeah, and, do. And, and, and one thing that, and this is stuff I'm still learning, <laughs> but, um, you know, I started working on the, the clemency stuff, and I'm 
looking for something and I misspell clemency in Google. Uh, and you know how sometimes you misspell something and it takes you something much more interesting than you, <laughs> sometimes not safe for work, but you know, this. <laughs> and, but I, I, I misspelled it and it took me to uh, it, something for sale on eBay, also could be bad, but it turned out it was a, a Roman coin. And it was a Roman coin that featured the Roman goddess Clementia. And I was like, huh. Um, and so I, I checked it out. And there's a couple of things that were really intriguing about this. One was that the coin was for sale for $28, which seemed pretty cheap for a Roman coin. Um, and another thing is that the Romans had a goddess of clemency, of restorative justice in a way. And, and I, I went back and I, you know, I, then I researched it a little bit and I bought the coin and then I found some other coins like that and I've given them to people, you know, that, that I think embody this, but um, including you. But the, um, that coin, it was so cheap um, because they made millions of them. And the goddess Clementia was the embodiment of a civic virtue. And she's pictured often holding hands with the emperor because the authority of government is not complete unless it includes that element. Um, and that's deeply powerful to me. Our very secular constitution also contains that civic virtue in the pardon power. And so the idea that there is a necessary reconciliation, a consideration of the fuller story, a role for mercy or a fuller justice isn't simply a religious one. It's a civic one. And we've mm -hmm. kind of lost that. That, you know, on, if the Romans, <laughs> millions of them were walking around with a coin in their pocket with the goddess of clemency, um, that's something that was a governmental virtue. And it should be a governmental virtue in our time, too. I love that. Yes? Yeah, I think rather they try to exclude it, right, Mark? I mean, they, they you know, the, the, the system as it's set up conspires to keep offenders and victims away from one another. I didn't even tell the prison the first time that I went down to visit him who I was. I think it took them a while to figure out, you know, who I was, because I was worried that they wouldn't let me in. Um, when David Bureau was sentenced, you know, and the news cameras were all waiting for us and we spoke to the press for the first time once the case was over and they said, you know, asked me like, are you satisfied with the sentence? And I said, I wish part of his sentence would be that he'd have to sit down and talk with me. Um, and it was so grateful that that was finally fulfilled because that would have been incredibly helpful. But, you know, th there are victim advocates that work for the prosecutor's office. It's not an independent office that, Literally, you know, when victims stand up in court, they'll like shield the victim physically from the gaze of the defendant. They, they don't want the defendant even looking at them. And I've talked to lawyers that are representing the, some of the juveniles who are being resentenced, who were so sorry and wanted to tell, at the trial even, wanted to turn around to the victim's family and say, I'm so sorry. And the lawyers are like, don't turn around, don't say anything, don't look at them, you know, so. I think not only is it not encouraged, it's actually actively discouraged in our system the way it is now. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have a good victims' rights law in Minnesota, um, but it's mostly for the protection of victims. And there is a real uneasy fit between victims telling their story and criminal justice, um, because that story often is going to conflict with either what the defense wants to say or what the prosecution wants to say. When I was in Texas, I was fascinated the first time that I saw a death penalty case. At the sentencing, because the victim's family members in Texas have a statutory right to speak at the sentencing of the murder. Uh, and so that's kind of a dramatic part of it. But they don't have the right to speak until after the sentence comes down. So it's after the jury's decided whether it's going to be life or death, and then they get to speak. And that struck me as very odd, you know, because you, you'd think 
it would be before then. And in some cases, if the, the, the victim's family members are vindictive, the prosecution will call them, or if they're forgiving, the defense will call them. But a lot of times they don't know. No one really asked them, and they have the right to speak, and then you find out after the, the sentence has come down. And it turns out that the reason that they didn't want the victim's family members to speak before the verdict comes back, the sentencing comes back, uh, bless you. It's, it, you know, partly there's ideas of relevance and things like that, but also prosecutors didn't want it because the fear of the forgiving victim. That they weren't going to go, you know, they, the, the victim's family may not talk to them or be fully um, uh, forthcoming, and they feared that the, that the victim's family members would, in that moment, with the person sitting there, say, don't execute. Um, and so because we are in an adversarial process, that full story fits uncomfortably with the process that we have. And I don't think that the need for humanity should change. I think the process needs to change to allow more of the humanity in. Mm. Yeah. Yes. So have you always been a forgiving person? Is forgiveness something that can be instilled or, or, or fostered? Um, if so, you know, my mother told me that when I was little, I was like the elephant that I would never forget. If you wronged me, you know, I could I forgive you, but I would like, I never forget <laughs> that you had wronged me. And so, and now that I've learned from this, that forgiveness is like that muscle that you have to exercise. A couple of years after all of this happened, I found out that, well, from a letter, this playwright from Chicago wrote me this letter that I got in my office that said, I've written a play about this couple that's murdered and there's this sister involved and all this, but this is my work of fiction. And I just thought that since it might sound familiar to you that you, well, it was based entirely on my story. And he'd been working on it for a dozen years. He didn't tell me. It portrayed everyone that I held dear in a terrible light. The, my law firm, my church friends, the Winneka police. I mean, it was just, it was this horrible, cheap, exploitative thing and I was just horrified. And so I tried to do a kind of restorative justice thing with the playwright. I sat down with him and my lawyer and said, you know, what can we do? You know, can you dedicate this, you know, profits from this play that you're putting on to a victim's family, you know, vic a victim's, you know, advocacy group? Could you put something in the bulletin, you know, the brochure about the play of, you know, talking about, you know, murder victims or, you know, no, 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 no. And I thought, okay, I just, I just have to, you know, I have to forgive this. I have to keep trying to find ways to, to redeem it. And sometimes you, you try and you don't succeed. But yeah, that's, that's what I'm doing. You had a question earlier. Did you? Yeah. Did, did we answer it? I love that question. At first, I did want to know why. Like, why? How could you? Well, you know, why? Why them? Why this townhouse? And then after a while, I, I, I didn't really care so much why anymore because I thought, what reason could you give me that would make any sense to me? If you gave me a reason, I'd spit on it. I mean, it just, you know. And then when I met him and he told me about the why, it it really did help to understand the, the thought process that it wasn't just like, I just want to see you suffer. That, that, isn't, that wasn't why. But yeah, that, that's a wonderful question. You know, I want to let you answer that first and then I'll finish it because you worked, as a prosecutor, you worked with victims in the legal context more than I do. Yeah. Mine is really through my advocacy and yours is through the practice, but I, I have an answer to that in terms of being a defense lawyer, but why don't we start with the prosecution side? Well, I mean, it, and it's, it's difficult because, because you, you'll sometimes hear people say about prosecutors, more often than prosecutors say it, that their client is the victim. Um, and, and, 
Most prosecutors won't say that. And it's because the victim is backward looking. Um, prosecutors can't undo the tragedy in the past. They can only undo the tragedy in the future. And so if you're gonna think about the client of the prosecutor, it's probably not the last victim, it's the next victim. And they have to find a way to incapacitate, to deter, um, to rehabilitate the defendant in a way that there's not going to be that next victim. And so, uh, you know, what I, I, as a prosecutor, I often argued for, for long sentences. Many of those I still think I was right about, and I'm glad that that, that argument won out. Um, uh, sometimes the victim may not want that, and you have to have your own moral compass that's going to take you in a different direction, even as you have, have empathy for that person going forward. So victims are a great use to be in my advocacy for my clients. A lot of it, how I, I speak to them and think of them and get them to see. I, I had a guy who did a really brutal armed robbery. He goes into a store that he'd frequented before, so he knows the owners. He's mad at them, so he's got a mask over his face. They know who he is. He's wearing the same clothes he'd been wearing that morning when he'd gone into the store. And it's all on camera, clear as day. He pistol whips them, they're hurt, they're bleeding, they're kind of leaning over, holding their heads, he's really hurt them. And then he's walking around their store, just helping himself to whatever he wants, a little laptop here and, you know, coins here, and just walking around, and this is the most horrible video, right? And you can see him pointing the gun at them before he pistol whips them. And so, my client wants to plead not guilty and go to trial, because he says, how can they recognize me? They didn't see my face. They didn't hear me say anything. Um, and so part of what I did is to get him to see, you know, what it would be like to visualize what it's like to be that victim and have to come back into a courtroom and see him sitting across from them and face him again after one of the worst moments in their lives. He's like, well, the gun wasn't even loaded. They, how could they be, you know, and I said, they don't know that. You're pointing a gun at them. They're thinking, I'm never going to see my kids again. I'm going to die, and they're going to grow up without a father. There will be nobody there to protect them and take care of them, provide for them. There's all this stuff that he had not thought of. And so the next time when he came back, he said, I changed my mind. You know, you're right. And then the other part of it is it's sentencing. Because sometimes what my clients want to do when they have that right of elocution at sentencing, where first you have the aggravation and mitigation, and then the judge says to the defendant, do you want to say anything? you know, before I sentence you. And sometimes what they want to do is this self-justifying moment, right? I'm sure you have had this before. We talk about this in class. <laughs> <laughs> Where they want to say, well, what I did wasn't so bad, or they try to excuse it or mitigate it. And sometimes that blows up whatever sentence the judge was going to give. In a very famous instance in Cook County, Illinois, it turned what was expected to be a life sentence from the judge into a death sentence, where the defendant's elocution was, you know, it's this victim's fault if she hadn't come home when I was burglarizing her house, you know, she'd still be alive today. I mean, she walked in on me. What was I supposed to do? God's forgiven me, so they should too. The victim's family should get over it. You know, they should just get over it and, and move on. That and the did judge, not work. No, yeah. you could, and people said you could see the judge's face turning to stone, and he said, Mr. Atkins, I find that the aggravation outweighs the mitigation, and I sentence you to death. And later on, when the steam lowered and the lawyers for the defense thought, well, we'll come back to the judge and like, see if we can do a motion to reconsider, and the judge is like, mm -mm. Mm. because he felt that he was talking. So I counsel my clients about what to say and what not to say at the elocution because of my perspective of what that's going to sound like to the victim's family. So uh, just two quick announcements here. The uh, first is we want to thank the Holleran Center for Ethical Leadership and the Professions and the Murphy Institute, their Catholic thought, law, and public policy for sponsoring today's program. Also uh, providing a light lunch outside since uh, it is the, the, the lunch hour. The second announcement is the bookstore has copies of Gene Bishop's book uh, for sale outside and Gene would be willing to, to sign uh, if you would be interested. And then finally, let's show our appreciation to Gene Bishop and Mark Osler.